Thank you very much. Uh, in our physical class, this is where we're supposed to start. Now, one of the reasons for these online or video lectures, one, it's to help us move faster. Two, it is also to help students to store these lectures. You know, physical class, the moment we are done with the class, everybody goes, you forget about what the lecturer taught you. But this one, when you download, and it is in your device, maybe your laptop, your phones, these days most of you carry very good phones. So you can watch over and over and listen carefully and jot down some things, compare with the slides, and of course go back to the material. You know you have your textbook, you have other books recommended and all that. You go back, read and make notes. By the time you do that, then you have some questions to ask in class and they will be able to you know, explain and it becomes easy. If we come for a physical class of one hour or two hours, we can now explain your questions that are coming up from these online you know, video classes. And once in a while, we also set up live classes that will help us wherever you are. We'll be able to listen to these uh, classes. So for module 1.3, we're going to look at solubility and solubility products. Of course, solubility product constants and so on. We're going to use outline solubility and solubility products. We'll apply the law of mass action, some illustrations one and two to show this. We'll look at what we'll call common ion effect. And we'll look at application of solubility product constant using illustration three. And of course, we'll conclude. So solubility is defined as the number of grams of solute that dissolves in 100 grams of solvent, usually at 25 degrees C. Now we're emphasizing on the temperature. Remember, like I said, if you're making a tea, if, you, if it is warm water, you observe that you know it dissolves more of your solid milk. But if it is cold water, in fact, sometimes the milk will not even dissolve at all. So if you increase the temperature above 25, it will dissolve more. If you increase the temperature, it will dissolve more. So we're looking at the number of grams, the quantity that dissolves in 100 grams of the solvent. That gives us basically the simple definition of solubility. Now this is quite different from solubility product, which is applied to only sparingly soluble electrolytes. And in most cases, solubility products applies to saturated solutions. Of course, you know what saturated solutions mean. When a solution is saturated with a salt, spirally soluble salt, there is equilibrium between solid state, the unionized molecules, and also between the unionized and ions in solution. That's equation one down there. We'll look at that. Therefore, there are two simultaneous equilibria. We have two simultaneous equilibria in a saturated solution of spiraling soluble electron. Look at it here. The first is the solid, AB, the unionized, and of course the ions are now separated, A plus and B minus. This can be an electrolyte, let's say something like sodium hydroxide. A represents the sodium and B represents the OH. So here you have the sodium hydroxide, and here you have the Na plus and the OH minus. So this equilibrium is set up for this sparingly soluble electrolyte. Apply, we now apply the law of mass action to get our equilibrium constant. You know, from that equation, the product is A plus B minus, now divided by BA, which is our initial sparingly soluble electrolyte, the concentration. But you know that since the solution is saturated, the concentration of the ionized molecule is constant at constant temperature. So you now see that this BA, the concentration is constant in equation two. That's why in equation three, we have used constant. Therefore, the ionic product here, concentration of A plus multiplied by concentration of B minus, which we call ionic product, is equal to our K, 
the equilibrium constant, multiply by this constant if you cross multiply, and that gives us the solubility product constant equation 4. So we say where Ksp is equal to solubility product, and A plus B plus is what we call ionic product. So hence, the products of the concentration of ions will be constant at a constant temperature. This ionic product and this Ksp is very important, as we'll see shortly. So we move further. For an electrolyte of AxBy, now we are bringing in pure stoichiometry into this. We see equation 5. Therefore, the solubility product will be equal to a plus to the power x and b minus to the power y. That's equation six. Therefore, generally, we have Ksp for this type of electrolyte as a plus b minus all raised to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient. Now, let's use something like barium sulfate as an example. Barium sulfate will ionize to give us Ba2 plus and SO4 to minus. Then the equilibrium constant will be equal to Ba2 plus SO4, that's the concentration of the ions, divided by the concentration of barium sulfate. Now, but the concentration of barium sulfate is constant. Therefore, the Ksp is equal to Ba2 plus multiplied by SO4 to minus. That's equation 9. Of course, we know that the numerical value of Ksp for equilibrium constants must be determined by experiment. And once we determine that, most of them are tabulated, you know, in standard textbooks. You can always get that. And we can determine KSP by measurement of solubility in water. So those values that are, are tabulated in standard books, we can use them, as we are going to see, by applying, you know, in application of solubility product constant principle. Okay, we look at illustration one, the question. The solubility of barium sulfate is 3.9 times 10 to the power minus 5 mole per liter. Calculate the solubility product. So we see the ionization. Remember our stoichiometric coefficient or stoichiometry. Barium sulfate will ionize as Ba2 plus SO4 2 minus. And since we are given that the solubility is this, because we have one is to one electrolyte, Barium has one mole, sulfate ion, SO4 2 minus also has one mole. So that gives us 3.9 times 10 to the power minus 5 multiplied by 3.9 times 10 to the power minus 5. So KSP is the concentration, the product of these two, and we'll multiply that and we'll get our solubility product for barium sulfate. Now, in the above example, we have said that barium, barium ion is equal to the sulfate ion concentration. It is possible to have a solution in which unequal concentration of barium and sulfate ions are in equilibrium with solid barium sulfate. For instance, unequal amounts of barium chloride and sodium sulfate might be added and the precipitate of barium sulfate forms if KSP of barium sulfate is exceeded. Now, this is one of the applications of KSP, which we are going to look at in the next illustration now. It says, given that we are given that the KSP of radium sulfate is 4 times 10 to the power minus 11, we are told to calculate its solubility in 0 0.1 mole sodium sulfate. Now, radium sulfate will ionize as radium ion sulfate ions. Let X moles of radium sulfate that dissolves per liter of radium sulfate, this O is supposed to be capital. Now, X moles per liter for radium ion, X moles per liter for sulfate ion. Now, KSP, which is four times this, is equal to that ionic product. So, since it's XX, we have 4 times 10 to the power minus 11 is equal to x squared. So we'll now do the mathematics and we'll get 6.3 times 10 to the power minus 6. So this is the solubility. 
Now we'll go to the second part. We are looking for the solubility in 0.1 mole sodium sulfate. So let Y be the moles of radium sulfate that dissolves per liter of 0.1 mole sodium sulfate. This is now, we want to use Y to differentiate with the X we used before. So look at sodium sulfate will ionize as sodium ion and sulfate ion. Now if you look at this, sulfate ion is being furnished by sodium sulfate. The same way sulfate ion is also given out by you know, ionization of radium sulfate. So sulfate ion is coming from both radium sulfate and sodium sulfate. They are common ions. So now, concentration of radium is Y, whereas the concentration of sulfate ion will be 0.1, which is coming from sodium sulfate ionization, and Y, which is coming from radium sulfate ionization. So we'll now go mathematically. Y, that is the concentration of radium, will be Y, and that of sulfate will be Y plus 0.1. Now, but KSP is very small. So that automatically means that Y plus 0 0.1 will be approximately equal to 0 0.1. So we'll now divide and we'll get Y. We'll now get our answer as 4 times 10 to power minus 10. And we'll come back to see the application of this that we have gotten. If you look at this value and also look at this value, 6.32 times 10 to power minus 6. You see that the solubility of radium sulfate has been drastically reduced in the presence of sodium sulfate, which you know supplies the same a similar ion so, uh, sulfate ion that radium sulfate also you know supplies in solution. And that is what we call common ion effects. The solubility of an ionic salt is decreased by the presence of another salt or solid that furnishes one of its ions. We've just seen that in the previous slide. Sodium sulfate furnishes sulfate ion just like radium sulfate. So in the presence of sodium sulfate, the solubility of radium sulfate was drastically reduced. And this is what we call common ion, ion effect. In most cases, this enhances the precipitation of substances with a common ion. One of the most useful applications of KSP is to predict whether or not precipitation will occur when two solutions are mixed. Now, this is an emphatic statement now. If two solutions containing the ions of the salt are mixed and the ionic product exceeds KSP, then precipitation will occur. When it exceeds KSP, there will be precipitation. But if it does not exceed KSP, there will not be any precipitation. And that's what we use illustration 3 to show. The question is, should precipitation of calcium fluoride occur when 50 ml of, we are giving calcium nitrate and another 50 ml of sodium fluoride, then we are giving the KSP. And that's what we try to solve here. Calcium nitrate will ionize as this, and sodium fluoride will also ionize as this. We have the initial concentrations for calcium and fluoride. So the next thing is we find the new concentration. What we did here is to use our dilution equation, that is C1V1 is equal to C2V2, where C2 is initial concentration. So C2 will be equal to, which is this, for calcium, C2, the calcium ion, C2 will be equal to C1, which is this concentration, 5.0 times 10 to power minus 4, multiplied by V1, which is 50, these two are given, divided by V2, which is 100, a mixture of 50 ml and another 50 ml of calcium nitrate and sodium sulfate. So it gives us 100 ml. And this gives us a new concentration of calcium. And then for new concentration of fluoride, we do the same, you know, C1, V1 divided by V2, and we'll get this. So we now determine whether precipitation will occur 
it is necessary to see if ionic product will exceed the KSP. So we'll now do calcium fluoride, ionizes as that. So we'll solve for, you know, substitute for the new concentrations and solve. At the end of the day, we are having 1.0 times 10 to power minus 11. And of course, we are given that the KSP of calcium fluoride is 1.7 times 10 to power minus 10. So this, our new value of ionic product, is less than the given solubility product constant. Therefore, precipitation will not occur. So we conclude that precipitation does not occur. So this means that if you want to get a precipitate of something in the lab, you do not need to go and waste your reagent and start trial and error experiment. Mix this, mix that, mix this, no precipitate, you discard, you'll be wasting material. But you can sit down and use this KSP, get the value of the KSP of what you want to mix. Now start doing this calculation until you arrive at the concentrations of the mixtures that will give you precipitate of what you want. Then when you walk into the lab, you use exactly those concentrations to get your reaction and you will get your precipitate instead of wasting the reagent. This module, we've looked at solubility and solubility products, apply the law of mass action, you know, to get our solubility product constant and ionic product. We looked at common ion when one substance furnishes a common ion to the substance that is dissolved. And we looked at illustrations for all this. And I hope you will enjoy the class. Thank you very much and see you in the next module.